Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. My name is Kenneth Whitwer, um, and we're joined here also by Metka Lanasi, who's the new chair of science and meetings for ISEV. Um, and we are going to have a very exciting paper today that was recently published in Science Advances. And so Joao Ferreira will be presenting. I also see that, uh, that Paolo is here, the senior author on the paper. So, uh, so welcome to you as well, Paolo, and feel free to, uh, to, to jump in during the discussion if you'd like. Um, so what I'd just like to ask everybody to do is to please put any questions or comments for Joao in the chat box as we go along. And then we will allow unmuting at the end as the discussion is moderated. So, um, so Joao joining us from Lisbon today, thank you so much for presenting and uh, please go ahead and share your screen. Let me just start by um, you know, thanking the organizers for this uh, amazing opportunity to present our work here. Of course, you are very excited to do that and it's a great privilege to, to present our work from, for them, you know, that we've been doing this for the last few years. And uh, so uh, today I'm going to present to you some of the data that we have recently published in Science Advances. And this is on the role of this protein called M2A on the selective sorting of uh, proteins into exosomes, right? And so for those of you that are not very familiarized with, uh, with exosomes, and I, I'll admit that it will not be many, so when you talk about exosomes, you are talking about, of course, extracellular vesicles, which are not to be mistaken by the uh, ones that are formed by the outward budding and shedding from the plasma membrane, which normally are called of, by microvesicles. Exosomes are rather formed by the inward budding of the endosomal limiting membrane. And um, uh, that, uh, that inward budding leads to the formation of these small interluminal vesicles, of course, then, that as, uh, as these endosomes mature, you'll get more interluminal vesicles and eventually a subset of these uh, endosomes will fuse with the plasma membrane and release its contents in the form of exosomes, okay? So in the next, in the, in the last few decades, intense research regarding exosome has been going on. And there's a lot of uh, research that have reported uh, uh, a number of, uh, roles for exosomes in the physiological and pathophysiological context. And this, of course, highlights the importance, the biological importance of, uh, of exosomes. But of course, the other side of this question is that the role of exosomes is a function of their contents, right? And uh, uh, even if we know that, of course, uh, exosomes contain uh, lipids, but also contain uh, proteins, and RNA, one question you might ask is, how are these contents uh, targeted to exosomes? Is this uh, some kind of stochastic event? And so the contents of exosomes are, are just uh, a measure of their abundance in the cell? Or are there specific mechanisms that could select and target uh, exosomal contents to where exosomes are being made or being born, let us say? Um, that in, in some sort of triage mechanism that could do this. And uh, as uh, when we started to get interested in, in, in extracellular vesicles, at the time that the, the idea that we had by reading the literature is that we had already, the people had already found some things about the, the sorting of cargo into exosomes. Of course, that it happened in, 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 in endosomes. But there were, for example, some information about escort machinery and how these were important to load proteins, but these proteins are dark uh, transmembrane proteins, of course. Uh, for another example would be uh, how some specific um, mirror RNAs are targeted to exosomes, and this involves uh, H2B1 protein and some specific motifs on the RNA. Altogether, we thought there were a knowledge gap regarding how are cytosolic proteins target to exosomes. And for us, that represented the window of opportunity. Now, you may ask, how, do, uh, how did we think we could uh, answer to this question, right? And this is because 
uh, uh, I have been um, interested in the past and, and, and my lab also have been interested as well in the two uh, uh, very important proteins for us, which were HSC7 and LM2A. And these proteins were reported to be present in exosomes. HSC70 actually since the beginning, I think, of you know, exosome research. And LM2A was more and more uh, uh, mentioned in, in these mass spectrometry studies, right? Um, but, but, but why is uh, LM2A? So for those of you who do not know, LM2A was first described in a science paper by Anna Maria Cuervo and Fred Dice. Uh, by the time they described LM2A, it was to, supposed to be the last piece on the puzzle that started uh, in the 80s. Uh, Fred Dice's lab were interested, was interested in the study of uh, protein degradation in lysosomes, and he found that some uh, proteins that were containing a specific motifs called, that he called KFRQ motif, uh, even if he later found that it was not really related to this motif, this motif has some degeneration, so it's more, it has more to do with the, with the characteristics of the, of the amino acids. But in any case, you'll have a pentapeptide. This pentapeptide is, was somehow identified by a chevron called HSC70, the bound sequences. And this somehow led to their degradation in the lysosome. So what they found in this paper is that LAM2A was actually working as the receptor of these substrates at the membrane of the lysosome. And uh, LAM2A in the lysosome would somehow uh, uh, make a discontinuity in the lysosomal membrane that would mediate the transfer of a protein from the cytosol to the lumen of the lys lysosome and then there to degradation. Of course, over the years, people found out though there were more um, uh, there were other components of the species, of course, other chevrons and cross chevrons, associated proteins in the membrane of the lysosome, uh, even a, a, a lysosomal form of, of HSC70. But in the end, what they found was a new way to degrade, uh, to degrade uh, proteins uh, in the lysosome that they called chevron mediated autophagy. Okay? So, because we've, people found that HSC70 and LEMTWA were there in exosomes, and because we knew and we were studying this mechanism in the past, we quickly formulated a we quickly formulated a an hypothesis that would be if lem 2 a and HSC70 are in exosomes, they would also be in endosomes, and there in endosomes they could act, lem 2 a could act as a sort of a hook that would trap proteins that would contain this KFRQ signal, or if you want to call it now in this context, exosomes signal. And this would load specifically some proteins, cytosolic proteins, of course, into these uh, interluminal vesicles, and then perhaps they would be released as exosomes to the extracellular space. Okay. So uh, to test the hypothesis is very simple, right? So we take some, we take some human cells, and we use CRISPR-Cas9, and we lock up, lock, lock out LEM2A. So specifically, LEM2A is one isoform of the LEM2 gene, you have LEM2A, B, and C. Uh, and um, the difference between uh, these three isoforms is mainly on the transmembrane domain and on the CT terminus that is on the cytosolic uh, part of this protein. And so when we target specifically this, uh, this uh, exon 9 of the LEM2A isoform, we were able to have a number of clones without LEM2A, but the, for example, that still express LEM2B isoform. And so we took these cells and we cultured them and we uh, isolated uh, the exosomes from uh, their cell culture media, okay? So when we did that, we were able to identify by mass spec around 3,000 proteins, a little bit less than 3,000 proteins, right? And when we uh, search the sequences of these proteins by KFRQ motifs, which I'm not going to go into detail how we do this. I mean, you can go to our paper or to others and see what are the rules to identify these, these motifs. We saw that around 62% of proteins that were present or that, that we identified on these vesicles, of course, um, contained at least one KFRQ motif, okay? And based on previous estimates about the, pro the, the amount of KFQ proteins that a uh, given cell 
pairs that say that there will be around 25%, this would represent a two-point-fold increase in the number of proteins uh, with KFQ pro motifs inside exosomes. So that was a, bit, a little bit encouraging. Of course, that when we quantify uh, and specifically we go and see the proteins from the MS data, that were downregulated, and then we we saw which of them contained a KFQ motif. We saw that around two hundred contained one KFQ motif, and a hundred did not. So this gave us an idea that perhaps there could be something here, and let me uh, play a role on 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 the presence of these cytosolic proteins in in exosomes. So to go further, we. Uh, devised a, a, a little bit different strategy. So what we did was we got some protein we, that did not contain a KFQ motif. In this case, we use M-Sherry, could have used other ones. In fact, we did use in, in different types of, in different uh, parts of our paper, other proteins. So in this case, we use M-Sherry and we fused to the end of M-Sherry a number of KFQ motifs. In this case was the original KFQ motif and the KFQ motif of alpha synuclein, in fact. And then, then in the middle, we just have a, a, a spacer, a connector of a, a few amino acids, okay? And so the idea was that we, if we express this protein with, the kefir, with this uh, KFQ motifs that we then call the exosignal signal for short, would be that this m sherry would be enriched in exosomes when we isolate them, right? So when we isolated the exosomes and we did some Western blotting, we saw that KFQ uh, tagged uh, m sherry was present. If the m sherry was not tagged by KFQ, you have a, a really big reduction. And then if these cells expressing m sherry with the, the exosignal tag, uh, but that are knockout for them to aids, uh, m sherry disappears as well. Um, furthermore, if we take these cells that were expressing m sherry with the exosignal, and they will knock out for lamp 2 a and then try to re-express lamp 2 a do a lamp 2 a rescue. Uh, we didn't have to be very efficient. In other words, we didn't have to express really a lot of lamp 2 a to really recover the presence of M sherry in, in these uh, isolated vesicles. Okay, so this uh, really then uh, uh, led us to think that we perhaps we were, we were right about this. Okay, so another thing that we did, that if you remember in the beginning, I was talking about shepherd mediated autophagy and how HSC-70 was important for this mechanism because it recognized the KFQ motifs. We also tried to see in HSC-70, this molecular chevron was necessary for this mechanism we're trying to describe. And because the knockdown or the knockout or the depletion of, of uh, HSC-70, it's very hard, it's a very, Important protein, important, important, very important gene in cells, um, and we, we, at least in our lab, we've never been very successful in efficiently doing this. Uh, so we, we we went for a different approach, and we use this uh, this compound called pifitrine that essentially uh, binds to HSC seventy and inhibits the uh, the the association of HSC seventy with other proteins. Specific, of course, also the ones that have the KFQ motifs. And so if we incubate cells with this compound and then look at the exosomes, we could see that if we inhibit the binding of uh, HSC72 with the KFQ motifs, we also had a reduction in the, in the presence of, of m sherry in, in exosomes, okay? So, um, how the one of the importance of course in the field is that if we want to call it exosomes we have to show the, that they have an endosomal origin and one of the ways that uh, the, like one of the initial approaches that we used to um to show this was by taking up the cells that were expressing uh, m share with the exosignal signal and expressing a constitutive constitutively active rab 5 or rab 5 ql as for short and this RAB5, what does is that it uh, inhibits the uh, maturation of endosomes into late endosomes on the endocytic pathway. It, is, it ends up uh, creating these really huge and large endosomes that are still able 
to, uh, uh, at least in theory, they're still able to create interluminal vesicles, right? So at the same time, these cells were incubated, were fed with uh, antibodies against CD63 in the hope that we then could label CD63 that, CD63 that was present in the interluminal vesicles, since, as you know, CD63 is a big uh, exosomal marker, one of the most uh, notorious ones. Um, and sure enough, when the image and it did this CD reconstruction, we could find these very enlarged rab 5 pl positive endosomes. These inside had these uh, uh, ELV, these, these vesicles, ELVs positive for this CD63 that were also positively for an m sherry exosigma. And for example, if you knock down uh, LAMP2A, we, you will find these vesicles inside the enlarged endosomes, but these are devoid of PA m sherry. Um, so the second approach to show the endosomal origin uh, that we used was by doing some uh, subcellular fraction. And to do that, we uh, did some little adaptations to a protocol from a paper in, in Nature Cell Biology. They use uh, sucrose gradients to separate two endosomal fractions. One that was enriched in, in EEA1 that we called early endosomes, but actually it's enriched in early endosomes, of course. And then a second fraction that it's enriched in RAP7, which is a marker of late endosomes. And EA1, of course, is a marker of of early endosomes. Um, also, these, uh, uh, these fractions were negative for uh, catepsin acting, uh, the active form of catepsin B, which uh, showed that these are, were not really uh, lysosomal fractions yet. Okay? So if you go and then and search for M sherry on, on, on these fractions, we see that when M sherry has the X signal is present both in the early and late uh, endosomal fractions. But if we do not have the KFAQ, the, the exo signal, or if we knock out plant way, we miss the localization and I'm sharing to these fractions. Okay, and this is the quantification, of course. Um, so at this point, we had the, uh, uh, some idea of what was happening. We, we thought we had shown that lamp 2 was important in loading some proteins into. Uh, uh, into nascent exosomes, let us say, um, that these, uh, that these uh, proteins contain this KFAQ motif, and it was, that this was uh, mediated also uh, by HSC7. Um, nevertheless, we were not the first to uh, report the loading of KFAQ uh, uh, proteins uh, with the help of HSC70 into exosomes. In fact, some years earlier, um, uh, Santa Rogers lab uh, found that this happened independently, apparently, on, on LAMP2A in late endosomes and with the help of the SCORT machinery. And uh, uh, the lab, the, the, the paper at the time described this as a form of autophagy, of they called it endosomal autophagy or EMI for short, right? So what we decided at this point is just we will try to. Um, make sure that this lamp, the lamp way was necessary for the loading of proteins at the endosomal membrane, okay? So how would we go about this? So what we did is that they decided to reconstruct, uh, uh, to do an in vitro reconstruction of the mechanism. And so we isolated early and late endosomes from wild type and lamp weight knockout cells. And so then these endosomes were incubated with, uh, a protein that we know the container KFAQ motif. And this protein was this, we used as a, as a, as a model substrate for, for, for this. It's called if one alpha. And we, we chose this protein because in the past we had worked with if one alpha and we knew that he had a KFAQ motif and we knew that it was a CMA substrate. And then we tested it. And then in fact, it was found on, the, on exosomes, only when lamp wave is present as well. And if we mutate if one alpha KFRQ, we uh, immediately lo lose it from exosomes. So if this happens in exosomes, if, if one alpha is present in exosomes by the action of M2A, so it should also be uh, incorporated in endosomes uh, by the action of M2A. 
And uh, so we did this, we used the uh, one alpha used GST as a, as a negative control and we incubated as well with ATP and HSC7 uh, to increase, uh, uh, to uh, sort of in, try to increase the loading. And so what we saw uh, was that um, uh, quite surprisingly was that in fact we could load if one alpha in endosomes in the presence of uh, HSC17 and ATP, but this only happened in early endosomes and it didn't happen in late endosomes. And uh, this was uh, surprising for us at the time, but then as time went by, we, we, we sort of adapted to this idea and tested this idea in different forms. We followed this uh, data, we followed this finding by uh, doing uh, confocal microscopy and we confirmed that m reacts a signal and lm 2 a uh, really co-localized with early, early endosome markers rather than late endosome markers. So kind of confirmed that this is likely, this mechanism is likely to happen in early endosomes rather than in late endosomes. So, okay, so this happens in endosomes, but is there any associated machinery that helps or participates in these mechanisms other than LEM2A and HSC70. Um, so and the, the first thing we asked was if the SCORT machinery is also helping because as you remember EMI uh, or endosomal microtophagy needed uh, SCORT machinery even if even though it, it didn't need LEM2A. So the first thing we did with is, is that we we uh, knocked down uh, TSG101 which is a, a SCORT1 component and we had a reduction in in, CD, in, um, in exosomes that we isolated, uh, but uh, apparently it did not change M. Sherry uh, exosignal presence in in, um, in exosomes. Another thing that we did was that we knocked down another component, this time a SCORT3 component called VPS4, and um, although we did not reduce apparently the release of exosomes that was previously reported, uh, it didn't also change the, the amount of the levels of m sherry exosomes ex in, in exosomes. So we thought that then also the interpretation of this is that of course the squirt machinery is probably, it's likely not involved in, uh, in, in our mechanism. So it's squirt independent. Um, so the question that goes after that is, are there other components score that are not dependent on score that participate for in the formation of ELVs, for example, CDC3 that was had been reported in the past, uh, participates in this, or it's led to a some counter, some somehow related to that or not? And so the first thing we did was knock out CDC3, of course, and then when it knocked down, we could reduce the, the, the number of exosomes by the measure of flotillin one that were released. And, and this time we, we had a decrease in, in the presence of m sherry ecstasy in the exo isolated vessels. So at, by this point, then we did, and uh, we tested another, a number of other, other squirt independent machinery, such as Sintonin one, Alix, Arp Sentry one, even using uh, a, um, a compound that inhibits the synthesis of the lipid ceramide, which is reported as a uh, important uh, ELV uh, formation lipid, uh, even uh, as well uh, uh, in many cases also uh, squirt independent mechanisms, and all of these uh, affected the, the presence of M-Sherry in 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 exosomes. So at this point, we thought, well. What we have here is perhaps uh, a mechanism that is dependent on LM2A, HSC70, and squirt independent machinery rather than squirt machinery. Okay. So we just decided to go a little bit further. So we did, we did some immuno uh, precipitation experiments. And in this case, for example, just, just uh, I'll give you some, just some examples. Here we uh, immuno precipitated CD63 and we checked for the co precipitation, for example, of LM2A. Uh, we showed that LEM2B does not co-precipitate with CD63, which is another isoform of the LEM2A, of the LEM2 gene. Um, and we can co-precipitate, for example, Alex, but you cannot co-precipitate this TSG101. Uh, on the other hand, if you immunoprecipitate either LEM2A or LEM2B, you can see 
that you can co-precipitate at CD63 when you immunoprecipitate LAMP2A and ALIX as well. You miss TSG uh, uh, and um, in the case of LAMP2A, you, you cannot co-precipitate efficiently either CD63 or ALIX, even though the antibody for LAMP2B is a little, little bit promiscuous, okay? So at this point, we decided to, to do a, a, something a little bit more complex. So instead of just immunoprecipitated, you know, immunoprecipitated in the protein, we, we would, and, and then hopefully, of course, the complexes, we would immunoprecipitate endosomes, right? So what we did is that we, um, we isolated either early or late endosomes from both wild type and then 20 knockout cells. No, just, uh, sorry, from wild type cells. And we incubated these endosomes early and late with the uh, beads that were previously incubated with either LAMP2A or LAMP2B isosomes. What we got in the end was immunoprecipitation of endosomes ones that were enriched in LAMP2A, this, as these ones here, and the ones that were enriched in LAMP2B, okay? So then if we go and check for the presence of some components of endosomes in these, in this, uh, IP the endosomes, we see some, we saw some interesting things. For example, we saw that uh, in lamp to be enriched endosomes, these lamp to be enriched endosomes are enriched in squirt machinery such as PPS4B and TSG 101, which was the one that we previously used. Um, but if we check for uh, Squirt independent machinery, uh, in this case, it was enriched in the lamp 2 a uh, enriched endosomes. Um, and this machinery was such as was CD63 Alex, for example, RAT31 as well. And of course, M Sherry Exa signal was that was enriched in lamp 2 a but was missing for lamp 2 b and uh, of course, late endosomes as well. So, what this data told us is that it's likely that endosomes are not all the same and that some specific components can segregate differently depending of the kind of lamp 2A isoform, the lamp 2 isoform, either A or B, that they contain in the membrane. Of course, this is just an hypothesis, but it could indicate something like that, okay? Right. So I think that at this point, um, we arrived at this model of uh, what we call the exosomal LAMP2A loading of cargo, uh, or ELOC for short. And in this model, we have uh, LAMP2A on the membrane of the, an early endosome. Uh, and this LAMP2A will then pull or trap these, these uh, KFRQ containing proteins. And these proteins are associated, of course, to HSC70 that somehow, we don't know how, targets this to the, uh, to the part of the membrane that is invaginating to, uh, to, uh, to form an, an, an interluminal vesicle. Um, and this, of course, happens with the help of associated machinery, such as CD63, Syntonin-1, Alex, and others. Of course, we still don't know. We, we, we don't know how, how this works yet, uh, uh, but, but it apparently needs uh, a bunch of these proteins. And then, of course, these early endosomes then uh, uh, get filled with interluminal vesicles, and then eventually some of them, a subset of them, will fuse with the plasma membrane and exosomes will get released. Okay, so um, this is the mechanism. This we think that we show that this, that this works, at least in vitro. Uh, does, this does this work in an animal model? Um, so we the, the, the next logical thing was to do this. We chose the zebrafish. We basically adapted the protocol from uh, Vaniel's lab, uh, where they uh, expressed uh, proteins or tag exosomes in the yolk syncytial layer. In our case, we created this construct where, where we would express M Sherry and uh, GFP tag with the exosignal that would be uh, uh, separated by a P2A. Uh, peptide that we that is cleaved when the protein is expressed. So in the end, we will get M Sherry and GFP exosignal separated. 
And the idea is that when you, you inject this construct here, then you'll wait until three days DPF. Uh, at this point, the Yolksin CCLA is a very secret, uh, um, it, it has a lot of secretion. Um, and this, uh, the, uh, this many, many uh, vesicles end up in the circulation and then you can image it in the caudal plexus of the larvae uh, at this point. And the idea would be that uh, if we are right and this mechanism works in an animal model, then GFP exosignal would be present in the circulation in vesicles that were positive for GFP exosignal, but M. sherry uh, would not be there, okay? And so, uh, as you can see in this movie, in this is uh, the caudal plexus of, of these uh, zebrafish larvae and you have circulation and you can see um, that we, we have some particles like that we can observe traveling around and we have also some, uh, you know, puncta that are associated the wall, it seems to be the, the, uh, the, the vessel wall, okay? So if we then analyze the steels, we see the same thing. And even if then we co-inject not only our uh, initial concert, but also a morpholino for synthenin A, which is a, a, a protein that, is, that was shown that in the zebra feature is associated with exosome uh, biogenesis and release. So if we use the morpholino, we would have a decrease in, in the secretion of exosomes, at least. Uh, we, we can remove this, the presence of, of this uh, vesicles that is called GFP exosignal positive vesicles uh, from, from the caudal plexuses. And if we use a LM2A morpholino, we, we lose as well. So at this point, I think we were uh, fairly sure that this also happened in, in, in the zebrafish, okay? Uh, we further uh, uh, use this, uh, took advantage of this model. We uh, use a fish, that, a zebrafish that express M. sherry on, on the endothelial cells. And we can see, for example, that uh, GFPX or signal, then you can see that it's present in, in, in inside endothelial cells. And but you can also see some vesicles that seem to be uh, traveling uh, in the, the vessel lumen. And even in some cases, you can see some vesicles that are outside of the vessel uh, plexus, which, which means that that perhaps could have traveled from the circulation to outside uh, the, uh, the, the plexus. Um, and for, for example, not only endothelial cells, if, if we express M. sherry in, in, uh, in, in, in macrophages in these larvae and the image the same place, uh, we can see that uh, uh, infiltrated macrophages that were present in the caudal plexus were also in many times, uh, there was some positive for these vesicles, which means that they, uh, of course, these vesicles that we think are likely exosomes were produced here in the, in the Yolksin CCLA layer, travels to the tripulation, reaching the telo cells and other cells as well, such as macrophages, okay? So finally, so we see that this happens, these, uh, these vesicles can travel, these are positive for, 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 for GFPX signal, but um, can we find a way to test the biological role of this process? Um, and so we did a, a, a final uh, essay uh, using if one alpha but so if one alpha as you might remember, is a, is a protein that we, we tested as a, a, a substrate for the, the endosomal reconstitution um, essay. But I didn't tell you what if and alpha is. If and alpha is in fact the transcription factor. And this transcription factor is the master regulator of the hypoxia response in cells. So what happens when uh, uh, the levels of oxygen decrease uh, uh, inside the cell is that if and alpha is stabilized, it goes to the nucleus, nucleus and participates in the transcription of a number of genes that help cells cope with hypoxia, such as glycolytic enzymes, root transporters, or the vesicle in the telial growth factor, which will then uh, be secreted and participate in the production of new blood vessels to reoxygenate the affected tissues. 
Now, up to this point, the hypoxia response were mediated by euphonopla was mainly a cell autonomous um, uh, mechanism. But now, with this concept, and because we showed the euphonopla was on exosomes, um, there was perhaps a more, a more systemic uh, component to this passage, okay? So what did we decide to do? We decided to isolate uh, exosomes loaded with e one alpha and then inject in the circulation of the larva. And then we would see, for example, the formation of new vessels mediated by the e one alpha. And, this, and we would see this on the, op, on the formation of the optic cup because it's very easy to image, okay? Uh, um, but before we did this, we uh, used a, um, a reported gene and did this in vitro just to confirm uh, that the effect that there would be an effect. So what we did, uh, what we showed is that uh, these exosomes that are loaded with E4 and alpha uh, are able to uh, activate the expression of if related genes, and this is in uh, in in the levels that is comparable to uh, to chemical epoxy that, that we uh, mimic with uh, cobalt chloride. Okay, and this was surprising, of course, and, and encouraging at the time. So when we did inject this then afterwards uh, in, in the zebrafish larvae, we found that the, uh, the, the vesicles, that, the, the exosomes that contain E4 and alpha uh, were able to increase the filament length, increase the, vo the filament volume, and increase the number of branches uh, of, uh, of the optic cup uh, at, the, at, five, day, at five days, Whereas uh, exosomes that came from cells that were missing uh, lem 2 a and therefore were missing uh, e for alpha uh, couldn't do that. We think that we, that we and we hope that we convince you that um, lem 2 a participates in the loading of QFQ proteins uh, into uh, ELVs in early endosomes that will eventually, in some cases, become exosomes. Of course, this involves not only lem 2 a but uh, HSC as HSC seventy as well. This this uh, cytosolic uh, uh, this sorting of cytosolic proteins, cytosolic proteins is able uh, even uh, if the KFQ motif is not original in the in the protein. So we can find any protein and then tag it with uh, with KFQ motifs or exo signals if you if you like and then it will be targeted to exosomes. This happens to occur early in the endocytic pathway, uh, specifically most in, uh, in early endosomes, and it, it apparent, it's apparently independent of the squirt machinery and associated to other squirt-independent uh, uh, components that are, that are involved in ELV formation. And finally, just uh, as uh, we, we arrived at this model um, that, the, that will be available soon, that will be published in a, in a, in a short commentary in the autophagy journal, uh, where we try to integrate all this information into two, uh, two, two alternative models. One in, in the left side, where basically we envision these uh, mechanisms to be just parts of different uh, stages of the of uh, the endocytic pathway, whereby ELOC is uh, uh, located mainly in the early endosomes. Then, when the endosomes maturate, they will perhaps become more active for endosomal microautophagy and inactive for for ELOC perhaps because all of the majority of lem 2 a is already on, on interluminal vesicles and it's not uh, available on the, end, on the endosomal membrane. And then, of course, some of these with either fuse with the plasma membrane or fuse with uh, the lysosome and, of, and then CMA, which happens really just on the lysosome. An alternative mechanism that we envision is that uh, perhaps not endosomes are the same. There are heterogeneous endosomes and that some endosomes have uh, uh, specific components and other uh, endosomes have uh, uh, different components. And this would, uh, in, this, in this case, we would have uh, endosomes that were ELOC positive, let us say, and these endosomes perhaps would be more prone, we don't know, but we are saying here that it could be more prone to, to uh, 
fusion with the plasma membrane. Uh, and on the other hand, would have uh, other endosomes that would uh, be uh, EMI or endosomal nephrotophagy active. And this perhaps could be more prone uh, to fuse with the lysosome and then lead to the degradation of their contents. Um, finally, um, let me just uh, thank all uh, people who are associated to this work, of course, people in our lab, specifically to Paolo, uh, the, the PI of our lab, the senior author of the paper, and then the Swartz as well, because she was a, uh, uh, the first author, the first author of this paper as well. Uh, other uh, members of the, of the lab and other collaborators, of course, our institute, finance, uh, finance, uh, 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 the financing agencies and, and facilities in our uh, institute that help with this, uh, with this, um, with this paper. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Joel, for these exciting results and sharing them with us today. And I'd like to invite everybody who has put a question in the chat box to get ready to unmute yourself when I call on you. If you can't, just let me know and I'll, I'll read out your question. Um, but I wanted to start, uh, Joel, with a question about, um, about the efficiency of this transfer. Can you, can you estimate, or is, this, is every vesicle that, that reaches a target cell delivering its contents, or do you think this is rather a minority of, of the EVs? <clears throat> Well, it's not that's not easy to answer that question. Not really. So the the thing. So in the beginning, because we were, of course, then we, we when we isolate. If I'm really understanding your question, when we isolate, we isolate a lot of these vesicles. So and in the end, we'll we'll end up finding a lot of the things that we intend to do, right? But then when we started to think about uh, uh, the effect these uh, vesicles would have on the receiving cells. Um, I myself and other people on the lab were skeptic that we would have uh, an effect even if we use small amounts, right, of this. Um, so the thing we, we started by using this, um, this in vitro system, and of course in vitro system we can overload it. But then when we went to the to the um, to the zebrafish and we saw the effect, we really got uh, surprised and. The thing is that uh, it, it seems that uh, the loading of all the receiving of these uh, vesicles is efficient, and that even in the context of using a uh, transcription factor, that you would not need a lot to really see an effect uh, mediated by this, right? Good, yeah, and, and sorry, I know that's kind of a tough question to answer, but uh, but thanks for your. Um, th thanks for your response. And, and now I will go to the chat box. Um, so let's start out with Rafa. Yes, thank you for your nice presentation. It was very interesting for me and a uh, very good job. Uh, I, I, I would ask, uh, I would like to, to know if you think that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, to 2 and uh, uh, HAC-70 may also uh, increase the number of uh, exosomes uh, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, is only uh, related to the cargo, the changes in the cargo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 um, the data that we got is that either by Western blotting, by measuring these, uh, these markers of, uh, of exosomes, or if we use the high half. Uh, or if we use the uh, nanocyte and we try to count the particles, you know the, the, the machine, of course, nanocyte, that you time to count the particles or evaluate the concentration, when we knock down lamp 2 a we never had a change or oh. dramatic change on the number of the vesicles, okay? So, and, and this is on the paper, I, I believe, so we never... So it could be a case, so we would have to test it, but all the evidences that we ever, ever got is that we didn't really change the number of so probably, exosomes, okay? Yes, probably yeah. is the cargo. Yeah, yes. so that's the interpretation, thank, I guess. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go next to Cristobal from Chile. A very nice, uh, okay. Very nice uh, presentation and interesting uh, data. So uh, my question is uh, if this process can be occurring in another physiological condition 
of uh, of the cells independent of of course of uh, epoxy uh, mm -hmm. and if it is uh, independent of a senior process not sure if i follow your question but if i did uh, we hope so we hope this is not just the case for uh, uh, if on alpha, but uh, I mean, you can go and, and to our paper and check our MS data. We have there, if you wish, a lot of proteins that are downregulated from exosomes when you knock out lamp 2 a And then, I mean, if those proteins have interesting roles uh, in cells, when they reach some cell, uh, then perhaps our... Uh, John, can I add something to that, if I understood correctly? So the question also has to do with the biological function of this mechanism and whether or not CNA, chaperone mediated autophagy, might compete with this process because they share similar players like LAMP2A, HSC70, and they act upon proteins that both have the, uh, the pentapeptide sequence, right? So we don't really, to, to answer your question, which I think is really interesting, we don't know enough about it, but uh, it's likely, and we've tried, we did some preliminary exper experiments where you induce starvations to promote CMA, and we have not yet analyzed the contents of the exosomes that are released in those circumstances. So that's something that remains to be seen, but obviously I wouldn't be surprised if there is some sort of interplay between these two pathways and whether some, you know, release of exosomes might be activated when you have some kind of failure for uh, on CMA, right? Uh, so that's that would be something to look at. Thanks, Bello. Mm, our next question is from Roberta Palmuli. Yeah, I was wondering if you had tested different early endosomal markers because I saw that mostly you use EA1 that it's also been shown to be present in late endosomes, so such as sub five. And also, like another question, if you think because you sort of see that lamp two A endosomes can be different from lamp two B, if you mm -hmm. think that this uh, biogenesis mechanism or the presence of lamp two A can sort of give like more of a secretory feature to this uh, multivesicular endosome. Okay, so regarding the first question, we did use RAP5 to uh, label uh, what, we would, what would be endos uh, early endosomal vesicles. We, well, we will only, um, you know, we can only get good images, good pictures uh, using uh, overexpressing RAP5, RAP5 tagged with GFP. The antibodies for RAP5, they would list the ones that are not very good. But we use that as a marker, and, and people was uh, accepted it. So that's that's uh, that's a, a positive thing um, uh, regarding your question. So the second question about the secretory. So that's that's one of our theories that perhaps the lamp two A's are more secretory, and the lamp two B's or whatever are less secretory. We still haven't done any experiment. I think that would. Uh, you know, prove this or disprove this theory, of course. But we do believe that that could be one of the things. Um, the only uh, bad thing about this, this theory is that LAMP2A has to reach the lysosome so that CMA happens. And if we assume that a lot of LAMP2A is secreted, then perhaps um, not a lot of LAMP2A reaches the lysosome for shepherd mediated autophagy. But then again, that would be uh, that would go to the the comment of Paulo, previous comment of Paulo about the competition of these two pathways that we still haven't addressed um, uh, in the lab, but that we that we mean uh, in the next uh, months or years to to address and to uh, figure out. Does that answer your question, Roberta? Do you have a follow up? Yes, yes, thank you. All right, perfect. Okay, we now have a question from Ursula Sandow. Who does not have her microphone, but um, but she says this is a great presentation. Do you have an estimate of the percent of the lamp two positive that are secreted, Ursula? Maybe you can clarify too. Do, do you mean the percent of the lamp two positive EV? So, oh, here we go. Specifically, the lamp two A secretion versus degradation ratio. No, no, we don't have uh, as of yet. Yes, um, uh, but. But yeah, it's some, something that in lab meetings, our lab meetings, it keeps coming out. And uh, 
we're still trying to figure out exactly how to do the experiment, to do it like efficiently and, and, and with power. Uh, it's not as easy as you may think to quantify this and then what really is in, in lysosomes and really is in exosomes and, and quantify this in some way. But, but, but um, uh, we will do it for sure in the future. Yeah, that's that was going to be my next question. How, how do you think you're going to do it? So, do, do you have do you have some ideas that you can share well, with us? Well, I think in my point of view, we'll have to isolate lysosomes uh, to find a way that accurately isolates those lysosomes and not endosomes, right? And uh, find a way to efficiently do this, and then we have to compare this, either having, for example, lamp to a positive and to a negative cells, and then see the changes that happen there when what we miss from lamp 2 a in the exosomes and in the lysosomes then has to be compared with the overall picture of of the substrate that we are assessing but then again it's easy to say but it's harder to do particularly because as lysosome isolation is not as easy as it may seem indeed well yeah and very good luck to you on those on those um, valuable experiments. So we're still getting some questions in the chat box. Um, so um, next, Sharif Ibrahim, can you please ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and my question is about the the list of proteins that um, uh, lamp two A is dependent. Uh, I I didn't notice uh, if they contain both membrane and luminal proteins or it's only the, the proteins that's inside the exosomes that's uh, dependent on lamp 2 a uh, also my question if, if if you know that there is some research related to the this um, um, domain the protein domain that's responsible for attaching this uh, the proteins to the this machinery is there anyone who try to use it to increase expression of certain proteins, uh, excretion of certain proteins inside the exosomes. Right. So the first question, I think, uh, the first question I think I got, uh, no, we don't really have uh, this, a separation. So the MS data uh, is with all proteins, right? Either membrane or cytosolic or whatever. All proteins are there. And as if you search, you'll see proteins that they go uh, up or down independently of having a cytosolic component or transmembrane or, or transmembrane. But that's because that's not the only thing that's happening on exosomes when we knock out lamp 2 and, and and that will be a, a subject for the future, right? But but if you go there and you can search that, we don't have it segregated, you'll have to go protein by protein. Is this protein cytosolic or transmembrane? And you'll have to see that. So the second question, I think I did really not quite understand, but I, I think you you were asking if other people had used this sequence. Well, maybe I can, I think I understood that the question is, and we did the experiment many times, is whether if you fuse this sequence, this pentapeptide sequence with a protein that does not have it, if it becomes expressed in the exosomes and it is released. And the answer is yes. And the results are very robust and very, actually we patented it at some point because we thought it might be interesting to target uh, proteins that are undruggable by any other means. So, I mean, you increase it dramatically. You have an increase of about 20 times in the amount of proteins inside these vesicles if you put this pentapeptide sequence in, in a soluble protein, which were well, the experiments that we did. I think I um, I don't know if this is done also or uh, if we can attach this pentapeptide also to something other than proteins. It would also increase its secretion, its excretion wow. into the exosomes, which theoretically, uh, if it's not done, could be okay also, right? I mean, yeah. if you can conjugate this peptide to other substances, of course, uh, I think it would work. Some chemical compound, if you can uh, attach it to it. Or, for example, if you think that you have some protein that binds an mRNA, and then you want mm. to you want to target target it to exosomes, you'll just fuse to that protein the the uh, the, the the tag. What we are still in the midst of doing is uh, trying to uh, maximize the efficiency of the tag. So changing the hypercues that are there, uh, doing tandem repetitions, uh, how much, how many. So these things that we are still doing, but for sure there, that's a possibility. A question here from Kerstin Stemmer. 
So that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also wondering, and since you were just mentioning the efficiency of the targeting, so um, the direction of the protein, whether it might go into CMA or whether it goes into exosomes, could this be nutrient dependent? So usually the CMA uh, is kind of when you are in a nutrient starvation situation. So if you starve your cells, you would maybe rather target them to the lysosomes. When you not starve the cells, you may rather go the other way. Could that be an option? Yes, that, that, that is actually a very you know, accurate uh, interpretation of the data. So the, the, it's not present on the paper, but we have done these experiments where we deplete, we remove uh, the serum from from, from cells, of course, because if we do this for a longer time, there will be, in theory, a form of activating CMA, right? And then, then if you isolate exosomes, you'll see you'll have less exosomes. We haven't done all the experiments to confirm that there are, in fact, less exosomes, but everything indicates that there are. And if there are less exosomes, then perhaps you'll have more degradation, right? And the, on the contrary, if you inhibit degradation, everything indicates that then uh, you'll have an increased release of exosomes, right? At mm -hmm. least the ones that contain the same sherry, for example, exosome. Mm -hmm. So that it would be, it's a very nice, uh, very nicely put that, yeah, the, the short answer is yes to all, yes. Super, thanks a lot. Very good. Well, thanks to everybody for the questions. We've gotten through the chat box now, and uh, but of course, if you have further questions about the paper, you're welcome to contact through the, the correspondence. Uh, so um, thank you very much, Joao, for presenting this work today. And thank you also, Paolo, for joining and for assisting here with the question and answer. Um, so I'd like to, uh, to invite everybody to please join a future edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club, and we wish you all the best with your work. Um, and have a have a great rest of the week, everybody. Take care now. Bye. Thank you. Bye.